Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the inaugural panel for Zero Waste Community Day. As uh, Ruth mentioned, we're going to start at the top of the zero waste hierarchy with a discussion on rethink and redesign. And, you know, um, we're starting here because the path to zero waste always leads upstream. And rethinking and redesigning the systems that define our lives is really the ultimate upstream action. Um, so my name is Jeremy Drake. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a zero waste consultant and one of the organizers for this conference. Um, I'm zooming in from Missoula, Montana, which is the ancestral lands of the Salish, Kootenai, and Kalispell people. Later today, my kids are, are lucky enough to be going to an outdoor school that they attend every Thursday. And it's on a land that's known by the Salish as Smilquilshina. And um, the people at that school are, are making an effort to create a relationship with the people who have the history and understanding of that land. Um, the reason why I mention this is because I think it's relevant to the panel that um, the path upstream is also a path of increasing and expanding our awareness. It's the awareness of our histories and of the systems that have shaped our past and our present. And with expanding awareness comes the opportunity to reimagine a more resilient, healthy, accessible zero waste world for everyone, for us, for our kids, for everyone. And the four speakers in this panel are going to provide different perspectives on what we can and really what we must rethink and redesign to realize that future. So following the presentations, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions during the Q&A. Feel free to pop any questions you have or, uh, into the chat as we go. Uh, we're gonna start now though with some brief inter introductions and then we'll, we'll get into the um, we'll get into the presentations. I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see our wonderful speakers while I do our introductions. So Kelly Dennings is a campaigner with the nonprofit Center for Biological Diversity. Prior to the center, she worked as a local government recycling coordinator and for North Carolina, is that NC, North Carolina? North Carolina's Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Keep America Beautiful, and the American Forest Foundation. Adoma Otto is Population Sustainability Intern with the Center for Biological Diversity, as well as a senior at Yale University studying environmental science and global health. With a keen interest in global sustainability, Adoma's research focuses on the nexus between environmental, social, and economic justice. Claire Mifflin is an architect and a systems thinker with over 20 years of experience designing buildings to a variety of standards, including Passive House and LEED Platinum. Her work focuses on how the built design of the built environment can enable regenerative and circular urban systems. Last but not least, Lindsay Hole uh, Hol is the CEO of Dispatch Goods and a UC Berkeley MBA candidate. While previously running Surfrider's, uh, Surf, Surfrider Hawaii's Ocean Friendly Restaurants program, she saw the opportunity for a reuse infrastructure to support circular solutions. She then returned to school to start Dispatch Goods, a reverse logistics company accelerating reusable solutions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly and Adoma to get us started today. Looks great, Kelly. All right, are you able to see my screen? Perfect, yep, okay, you you well, thank you. you all. So for those who are unable to see me today, I'm a petite, white, middle-aged woman with long brown hair, so not what you're seeing here on the screen, um, standing in my living room. And I want to acknowledge that I am on stolen Choctaw land, where, as we've talked about, many individuals face displacement and suffering, and I hope one day they do receive restorative measures. So thank you for those um, earlier land acknowledgments. So for a quick introduction about the center, we're a national nonprofit conservation organization that works through a combination of science, the law, activism, and creative media 
to protect wildlife and the wild places they need to thrive. So on the screen, you're seeing all of our different programs. Feel free to check out our website. So why are we here today to talk about capitalism? Well, the US is 5% of the world's population, but uses 30% of all resources, creates 30% of all waste, and emits 15% of the world's carbon emissions. The average American has an environmental footprint 60% larger than most Europeans and nearly 700% larger than the average person in most African countries, which is what's being depicted here on the screen. So from this graphic, which you can get from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, it really to me shows global supply chains and where their problems are. And the common denominator happens to be transportation. We hope that this jumpstart systemic alterations, um, the issues that we're encountering with these supply chains, to new business models and how we produce and consume goods. And I don't need to tell this group um, that waste systems built around reuse, refill, repair, borrowing and sharing, and finally recycling and composting will create local jobs and resilient equitable communities. And you're going to hear more about this from my fellow panelists. So. Uh, how did the center get to this point about talking about capitalism? Uh, well, first we conducted a design thinking ideation session. So this is kind of one of those post-it note exercises where you brainstorm problems and solutions. And one participant mentioned capitalism as a problem. And you can see here that some other ideas from the group could be aggregated with that theme. So that was the first place we heard it. And then we were conducting some focus groups around topics of interest to the center based on the Urban Sustainability Directors Network Sustainable Consumption Mind Map, which I'm showing here on the screen. Well, capitalism wasn't a topic we sought to learn more about specifically, but throughout the series of conversations, it came up. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we heard. The sentiment from one group was that people feel they have the right to consume, even if levels impact the bigger environmental picture or themselves in the future, and overcoming this perception of entitlement is pretty difficult. In this line of questioning, equity came up a number of times. In a different group, the sentiment was that capitalism wasn't the issue if it worked the way it should by creating products needed by individuals and markets supplying the demand. But participants believe that the manufacturers are now telling us or marketing to us, uh, maybe in a predatory way, what we need, causing a more consumeristic issue. So throughout the focus group, this question would arise. Does a consumer really hold the power over a manufacturer? And it was noted that capitalistic market forces dictate what products are created so an individual can change impact through their purchasing power, albeit maybe in some sort of an aggregated way like plant-based food. Participants agreed that an individual can cause change, but then asked in return, the question was, will they? And this is a narrative that's common among upstream entities to deflect, saying a product or package is really only created because it's being requested by individuals and the market responds accordingly thus putting the responsibility for solving our consumption issues back only on the individual again. So the center believes that this is a both end situation. Not only do we need systems level changes, but at the individual level, we need to instill societal norms that nourish community, sustainability and health versus overconsumption. But I wanna acknowledge that talking about consuming less is not necessarily an equitable request. The center talks about this in relationship to conscious consumption. So some people do need to consume less, some need to consume differently, and some folks, even in the United States, do need to consume more. And maybe this is in relationship to food, clothing, and shelter, but even things that bring people joy. So over the last couple of years, this topic's been coming up time and time again as an issue that was related to our work. So we decided not just to focus on circularity and product stewardship, which we do, but to look into capitalistic alternatives. So I'm really excited to have Adoma with us today, my colleague um, who's helping us address this topic. Over to you, Adoma. 
Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, my name is Adoma Addo, as, as Kelly mentioned. I am, for those who can't see me, I am a Black woman with locks currently sitting in my office. I'm also currently on stolen Quinnipiac land. I'm going to be talking a little bit about our research into post capitalism as a transition framework, um, presenting some of our high level concepts um, through an infographic um, on the next slide. So this infographic presents a variety of justice dimensions that are all key components of the post capitalist transition. All the dimensions are overlapping and inherently interconnected, centered around the concept of post capitalism. But what even is post capitalism? Post capitalism as a framework recognizes the harms of extractive economic growth intertwined with racism and patriarchy. And the framework here proposes a series of economic transitions for a world founded on gender, racial, environmental, and economic justice. To begin with the justice dimension, uh, the justice dimension involves advocacy for the care economy, improving universal access to affordable health and social care services, um, in addition to recognizing um, the interactions between um, patriarchy and capitalist injustice, um, which, ne which necessitates advocacy and education for non-binary family roles, deconstructing um, set gender roles and really reconsidering what it means to be uh, a part of the nuclear family for the benefit of all. Also connected to that is the issue of racial justice, um, which requires structural and cultural um, changes, such as wealth redistribution and reparations, as well as anti-racist education and advocacy, all through the lens of decolonization. The next component, as I'm sure we're all aware of, is, is environmental justice, um, which proposes um, transitions such as the circular economy, um, representing a fundamental component of the post-capitalist um, transition, encouraging the elimination of waste and extending product life cycles, um, in addition to the donut economy, um, which uh, connects to larger climate goals, climate justice goals, um, and highlights um, both social and planetary boundaries for um, people and planet. Finally, um, as we've, we've, we've sort of alluded to earlier on, the sharing economy, um, which is focused on cooperative exchange of goods and services, focusing on building community relations and minimizing the impact of waste. The last dimension I wanna mention is um, the economic justice dimension, which reflects a larger need for economic transformation involving livable wages, um, improved working conditions for all, Additionally, the economic di uh, dimension involves um, transitions towards more regenerative um, economies that counter our current uh, system of endless economic growth. And um, while there are a variety of strategies that can be involved in, in this discussion of countering endless growth, one strategy that we'll talk about in a little bit more in depth is a solidarity economy, um, which involves supporting worker ownership, cooperatives, and community land trusts, as well as a couple of actions that I'll get into on the next slide. So the solidarity economy is an alternative framework um, for economic development grounded in the following people-centric principles. First being um, solidarity and cooperation, the next one being equity in all dimensions, be it race, gender, or class, as well as um, social and economic democracy. Ultimately, um, these are all tied together um, with a sustainability lens um, and a commitment to pluralism, recognizing that no one approach um, fits all. Fundamentally, the solidarity economy is about systemic transformation. It acknowledges that the economy is embedded in a global natural and social ecosystem. However, it has the capacity to change, even if it starts on a small scale. To consider the solidarity economy in practice, here are two examples of worker-owned cooperatives um, that highlight community involvement. The first one being Pedal People on the left, which is a people-powered waste hauling and transportation service in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, the second one is the Garden Project, which is focused on community empowerment of domestic violence survivors um, for sustainable agriculture and food security through training courses and collaborative um, gardening. These aren't just examples. These are real organizations and there are likely um, some in your community that you can support as well. For more information, we'll be sharing out a set of links uh, at the end of the slide share and you're, you're welcome to look through and try and find um, different examples of the solidarity economy and practice in your specific community. So this presentation has really considered uh, many of the overlapping structural issues associated with the current systems of oppression, conceptualizing some of the necessary transitions in response. Our proposal uh, of a just post-capitalist system um, highlights the need for both equity and justice across all dimensions, 
ultimately creating solutions for both people and planet with improved resilience, healthier and thriving social environmental systems. Um, we look forward to answering any of your questions at the end. Thank you so much. And yes, these are our resources. I apologize. Thank you, Adoma, and thank you, Kelly. Um, if you stop your sharing now, then Claire, you're up. Great. Welcome, everybody. So um, I'm going to talk about how design can change the system. Can you see my screen fine, Jeremy? Looks great. OK, so we need to design cities to function like forests cycling all materials. We need to create systems which enable people to thrive as they create good soil, like this beautiful mushroom here. And it's much easier to do that if we're designing a city from scratch, like this floating city. Oceanic City aims to grow much of its own food, source sunshine and rainwater for its energy and water needs, and we did the zero waste strategy. Designing in systems for borrowing, reuse, repair, and circularity, rather than single use and trash. Food grown on the island and bulk goods coming from the mainland are all packaged in reusable containers. Food waste is weighed before disposal to give feedback for more accurate ordering, and is moved with a small pneumatic tube directly to a small anaerobic digester, which creates heat and power. The power goes into the electricity grid and the heat warms the water to wash the reusable packaging and dishware. Food waste from homes, landscaping and farming goes to the compost gardens to make soil and grow more food. There's no need for garbage trucks. Bulky items can be transported by cargo bike and anything else, spent batteries, worn clothes, broken toys, gets put into a reusable bag with an ID tag to identify the material and source and is conveyed by pneumatic tube to the sorting center. Here, residual materials are metered, like water or electricity, and sorted to facilitate repair, reuse, or refabrication. With data, over time, strategies can be tweaked to reduce waste further and applied as evidence-based solutions to other cities. The city will welcome circular economy businesses and have co-ops for fixing and repair Libraries won't just be for books, but anything from tools to musical instruments. Consumer goods from electronic equipment to children's furniture will be leased rather than owned and returned to the store when maintenance or an upgrade is needed. Goods, furniture, and the buildings themselves will all be designed for disassembly, so at the end of life, they can be repurposed into something new. And we're really looking forward to starting work on this design for the prototype of the floating city in Busan, South Korea. But if we look at the material flows in the city here, diagrammed here, we see there's a lot of circular movement of reusables, laundry, food waste, and some other materials. Um, some at the small scale on the module that we see here, like washing or composting, and others at larger scale to central libraries and repair hubs. And some actually have to go to the mainland, say for some recycling, for example. Um, but if we look at a typical city like New York City, our flows are very different. They're very linear. It's goods in, trash out. So how do we transform an existing city to facilitate circular material flows? And I've also studied biomimicry and I look at ecosystems and they start pretty linear too. After a fire or volcano, in come pioneer species that take resources and grow and reproduce as fast as they can little like capitalists. But over time, ecosystems become more complex, diverse, and circular, like these forests where energy, water, and materials circulate mostly within the system boundaries. Three key attributes that increase as they do so are collaborative relationships, feedback loops, and niche specialization. So we have to design our systems so they support collaboration, incorporate feedback and adjustment, and support diverse local initiatives that fit in with the unique characteristics of a place. This has led and informed our advocacy campaign, Put Waste to Work for New York City, to help New York City transform to its waste systems to help 
um, reach zero waste. And we've started by identifying strategies to help facilitate circulation of material flows, allocating space for reuse, repair, refabrication, and composting. Because like most cities, New York City has zoning laws which say what can be built where, and manufacturing is um, these purple zones, and they're on the outskirts. Um, to, to separate them and to allow for imports, but people do live by them. And of course they suffer from the track traffic and industrial pollution, same as those who live along the side that New York City's landfills are incinerators. So we need to look at changing zoning because we don't have zoning categories for things like small composting facilities. We just have waste transfer stations and small composting facilities need to be small and diverse within neighborhoods. So Boston's rezoning for urban agriculture or the US Composting Council's model composting ordinance helps to give pointers of how we need to change zoning if we want cities to become circular. Leaf specialization is about finding opportunities unique to place, like participatory city did in London, where they took empty storefronts and invited people to drop in and develop ideas for community collaboration, many of which were about reuse, repair, growing and making things. Or we could provide space in those storefronts for libraries of things. And then um, currently all our systems from our bins to our chutes prioritize trash. So we need to design return systems so it's as easy to drop off a reusable cup as it is a disposable one. And that means um, waste stations need to incorporate stacking like Cup Club on the right there. Um, so it makes it easier to return reusables and also at every scale incorporate dishwashing and, and return of reusable packaging. Our next um, set of strategies is about um, the need to contain waste because New York City still uses bags and they block sidewalks, um, attract rats, cause litter, block storm drains and cause injuries to workers. So for many neighborhoods, shared collection is the solution, shared in the street or submerged. Following the zero waste design guidelines, the departments of sanitation and transportation did start a small clean curbs pilot program for private haulers. We're calling on them to do a larger pilot by the city like they did in Paris. They piloted 40 of these waste stations for recycling shown in the center photo there. And they assessed it, they took feedback, and now they've procured a thousand permanent ones throughout the city. All throughout the city, these systems that prioritize trash are there. Like in New York City, a new building has to have a trash chute, and then it has to have bins for recycling alongside. But if we add organics as well, it takes a lot of labor, and that's not that equitable because many buildings do not have enough labor to do a good job. So we should have central waste stations um, and central waste rooms. Um, in Korea, they shut down chutes and new buildings have large central waste rooms, which allows many more streams and places for reusables to be dropped off and oversight for volume-based charging. Then the third section is about compost and it really comes from the demand. How can we make sure that all city soils are regenerated with compost and consider that part of maintenance. New York City has a great community compost project where thousands of New Yorkers drop off food scraps and it's taken to composting facilities, there's five of them, and then made into compost. But it only deals with about 1% of the organic waste and only is applied to a small percentage of landscaped areas. And even though many of these compost sites are in parks, they typically don't compost that park's waste or get applied to that park's soils. And parks department haven't renewed a lot of their leases, believing composting doesn't belong in parks. But I think it does. And it, if you think of it in terms of maintaining the park and the recreational opportunities for the community composting, we should be doing that. And then we should be thinking of biocycles at a larger scale because we're not gonna have enough need for all the compost in New York City. So how can we make fertilizer that can be returned to the organic um, um, farm system, the regional farm system, displace fossil fuel compost? 
So here's another project we've worked on where we've got two strategies. We've got one strategy of an in-vessel composter ma managed by the, hort uh, the horticultural staff who maintain the green spaces, but there's going to be a lot more food waste here. It's a food incubator. And so we have a dry aerobic biodigester, which will take make organic waste to be returned to the regional food system. Similarly, um, Domino Park has uh, horticultural staff maintaining their in vessel composter, and they accept enough food waste that they need to maintain the park. And if we do this, the benefits in New York City will be huge and help them achieve many of their goals. Because what do we want our cities to be like? Full of storage buildings, unoccupied buildings full of unused things, drowning in trash and litter, or circular cities with low impact transportation and reimagined streets and green roofs and healthy streets street trees full of collaborative relationships and systems optimized by feedback loops where we create good soil for good things to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That was wonderful. I encourage everyone to um, put some questions that you might have in the chat. Um, and as Lindsay cues up her presentation after Lindsay we will have some time for a little Q and A. Looking good. Looks great. Okay. Lindsay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to share my journey. Um, my goal is really to talk about. Uh, our experience is building a reverse logistics company to support circular systems, um, particularly in the food packaging space, and where the economics uh, work in reuse and where uh, they are more difficult to overcome. There's challenges in, in with some products. Um, and then some suggestions of how we can, uh, you know, kind of shift the market to support uh, the, the areas of opportunity and challenge. So, um, to give a little bit of background about Dispatch Goods, we're a reverse logistics company accelerating the shift to reusable packaging. Uh, like Jeremy mentioned, I got into this space as a ocean lover and surfer. I was living and working in Hawaii and really devastated by microplastics on the beaches. And so came to this uh, space really as someone who wanted to protect what I loved, which was uh, the oceans and surfing. Uh, so launched a program with a uh, surf rider foundation called ocean friendly restaurants where we helped restaurants uh, transition to more sustainable practices but as the market shifted to more takeout and delivery i was really devastated by the number of single-use items that were going out the door even if they were hypothetically compostable particularly in hawaii there is no um like a uh, composting infrastructure so they really all, all were heading to landfill so went back to get my mba to tackle this problem um, and I met my co-founder Maya, um, to the, who's uh, pictured here to the left, who was the West Coast Partnerships Lead for Caviar and then DoorDash after the acquisition. Um, and she saw this problem firsthand through her job in those companies about how much waste one, one or two companies were generating. And really, as she was raised an environmentalist, I kind of came upon it a little later. Um, she felt like her work life and her kind of morals were in direct opposition. So she left uh, in February of 2020, best timing ever, um, right before the pandemic and joined me full time to, to really tackle this problem. And so we've teamed up uh, and, uh, you know, the problem we're tackling is enormous, both in the size, which we hear a lot about, but also in the dollar amount. It's really shocking to understand how much businesses are spending on packaging. So we talked a lot about post-capitalism world. We really did see this also from a capitalism lens that there's a strong argument for reuse with some products uh, that I'll discuss and some where it's harder to, harder to make that economic case. Um, so uh, we set out to build a, a very similar to inf infrastructure to what you're hearing about, which is there needs to be a reverse logistics infrastructure that's similar to recycling. Um, and in the US that in for the majority of Americans have a curbside collection system and I know that there's 30 to 40% that don't have access to curbside recycling or don't participate in it. Um, and in our opinion, this allows us to recapture the value of that packaging that's getting pumped out into the world 
as well as allows better packaging to be introduced. So we collect from homes as well as businesses. We have a processing facility that processes a variety of products in different ways. And then we essentially resell products back to businesses and we try to do it at a price that's lower than what they would pay buying new. And that's not always possible, but that's our goal. And so we have had a journey from when we started to where we are now, but what we, we, we've really come to realize is both from a logistics kind of efficiency standpoint, as well as from an equity lens, reusables need to be the default option. It can't be that something that people need to pay a membership for or something that people need to pay uh, an upcharge for, which is how we started. Um, because of the fact that we cannot afford as a society for five to 15% of consumers to be participating in reuse and the vast majority still not be. Um, and so uh, that was a journey for us. We weren't sure if restaurants, which was our go-to-market, um, would be willing to take this risk with us and shift over to all reusable packaging. But uh, in San Francisco, about 70% of our volume now is coming from restaurants that have made the complete shift over to reusable packaging. And that is a very strong indicator. And what we realize is our system now is close enough to recycling that they don't feel like it's an extra lift to ask their customers to participate in reuse. And that was always the goal, to make reuse as easy and hopefully more delightful than single use. So the system, as it exists right now is that customers receive reusable packaging and some of the packaging dispatch owns and now increasingly some of the packaging we don't own. We're just helping businesses get back. Um, and then there's a, a QR code on the packaging that customers can scan to schedule collection or find return bins. Um, and then we come and collect from the return bins or from homes. Um, just like recyclers, we only visit every neighborhood once a week so that we have a really streamlined um, kind of uh, routing system to keep our, our footprint low. And we also offset all of our miles. Um, of course, like we wanna to transition to uh, electric vehicles and, and better sources of um, transportation over time. Um, but there's a starting point and then there's the, um, you know, kind of the destination. And then um, we take things back to our facility. Um, we call it like a little micro hub and we process and, uh, and then resell that packaging back to business. And so what we found is there's some items where the economics are really strong for reuse. Glass is a good example. There's no reason for us to be breaking glass down just to make new glass. Glass is something that can and should be reused. And when you get enough density and scale, the economics are stronger for businesses to buy upcycled glass versus new glass. Luckily, there's been some policy that has uh, helped to support this movement. And so for us, glass is a really great product and uh, like straight out the gate to, uh, to enable reuse of. And there's a handful of other products that we're processing that very similarly, the economics are strong for reuse. And so with these products that we're stacking over time, our goal is that eventually you don't have to scan this QR code to schedule collection, just like recyclers, uh, we have a dispatch day and you're putting out your reuse bin and dispatch is coming to collect. Um, and so uh, right now it is that there's a dispatch day in every neighborhood, um, but there's still that extra action item of scheduling a collection since it's not a universal system for everyone. Um, but once we have enough businesses on board, the idea is that uh, you will be able to um, fill up a bin with reusables rather than uh, recyclables, hypothetically recyclables, compostables, and, uh, and landfill bound items. Um, <clears throat> It's really exciting because this time last year, we were collecting an average of three items per stop. Now we're at about 10 to 14 um, for two reasons. One is that uh, we have more return bins, so there's more people going to return bins. Um, also, we just have more partners. So people have ordered from multiple places or gotten our packaging from, from multiple businesses. Um, and then uh, the last reason is we've also expanded the number, the types of items that we will collect in those, in those routes. And so um, I wanna point out a couple items that it's difficult for us to cost compete. And really that's when the default uh, most common is a kind of thin film or um, uh, like low value plastic. Um, so we offer steel containers to restaurants. And right now we're about 20 cents more than compostables per use and then about double what plastics are. So we are capturing restaurants that feel as though this is a better experience that they can offer to their customers um, and that their customers are demanding this. 
Um, but when we talk to fast casual restaurants that are running on razor thin margins, it's it, like the conversation doesn't get very far. And so, uh, you know, our options really are to have a cheaper product offering where even if we switch to another material type that's uh, lower cost, it would be still difficult to compete with a 10 or we've heard as low as 13 cents container um, because you cannot support logistics and pay people a living wage and charge uh, basically 13 cents for all of that, those logistics. Um, and then, yeah, polypropylene containers. So we have some partners that are repurchasing polypropylene plastics for reuse, which is amazing because it's one of the plastics that are, um, uh, you know, dishwasher safe, microwave safe, um, have, have less of the le leaching characteristics. We don't love plastics, but sometimes when you look at the LCAs, plastics make sense uh, in certain settings. Um, but we still are relying on businesses to pay more for used plastics than new plastics, which makes uh, it a, a case for businesses that can't afford and know their customers care. But again, for um, businesses that are really concerned about their margin, it is difficult for them to, um, to use reused products versus uh, uh, new plastics. Virgin plastics are still the cheapest plastic. So um, I wanted to point out the obstacles to a complete overhaul, which really, in my mind, come back to one, one kind of core concept. If we are going to keep capitalism, which maybe we will, maybe we won't, um, I think that we need to do a better job of really holding businesses accountable for the negative externalities of the products that they are uh, providing. And that's where we're talking to major chains that are keeping their eye on the extended producer responsibility laws that are being introduced and say that they will make the shift when that happens, that's when the economic case for reuse will be stronger than for single use. So we are not even at scale going to be able to compete with 13 cents or thin film plastics, really cheap single use plastics. But if we start to hold into account all of the negative things that are happening to us as a planet, us as a society for those products being pumped out by businesses and manufacturers, that's when the economic case is going to be strong. And so um, I think that if anyone wants to talk, you know, about uh, policy and where it, where it could help create tailwind for reuse movement, um, we definitely have a lot of experience and have been able to replace over a quarter million items from the waste stream this year. So um, learning every day and um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. What an amazing adventure that uh, looks like it's been for you and your partner. Um, so we do have some questions in the chat. I'm gonna scroll up and uh, start with Kelly and Adoma. Uh, this one's from Zan McPherson. How can the waste industry drive toward these solutions of post-capitalism and solidarity economy? And what is the role of government versus business versus individuals in this? Kelly or Adoma, you want to take a crack at that one? I can start Adoma and you fill in. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, on the business side of things, um, there there's really these ideas of, and and I I recommend you you click on the link to read the other um, examples of the solidarity economy. But it's things that are probably already in your community, like community sorted agriculture. Um, co-ops, unions, um, land trusts, um, uh, mutual aid. And so it's really just kind of, um, if you're familiar with B Corp, it's, it's like one, one thing beyond that, but really taking kind of the social uh, aspect along with that. Um, and then on the government side of things, I would say if you have any sort of grant program, which when I worked in both North Carolina and for local government, we had a grant program. It would be great if you were to, um, you know, support these new models of cooperation and um, and working together. So that that's kind of the business and uh, and government side of things. So Domo, what do you think? Yeah, I would I would echo the part about the business in particular because um, in our our work with us. Solidarity economy. There's really a, a wealth of, of um, interest in worker-owned cooperatives taking on the issue of waste. Um, there were several um, that are all in that presentation that talk about um, compost and waste hauling um, and really 
looking at community oriented um, means of, of handling waste. Um, and so there's there's a, a real wealth of, of information there. And I really encourage you to take, take a look at that presentation because there's certainly a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. And, and also I'll say that later today we have a recycling as infrastructure two session plenary panel. Um, well, we're going to hear from um, uh, a new uh, recycling center in Michigan that's part of the Association for Mission Based Recyclers. So it's taking a bit of a different spin on um, uh, helping with the recycling economy uh, outside of the, the standard um, profit based in the, in the initiative. Um, Great, thank you. So the next question is for Claire, it's from Judith Humble. What city in the US has made the most progress toward becoming circular? What financial incentives can be described for city governments? Um, that's a difficult one because I haven't assessed all the cities to know, but I am doing some work in San Francisco and they've made um, great steps for sure on building materials and furniture. Um, they're working with Reapley to try and do inventory management and they have, um, yeah, looking at reuse of, of, of furniture, building materials and things like that. And of course they have um, their mandatory organic separation. So I think they're doing pretty well. Paris has some very interesting ones. They're not in the US. Um, and policy wise, um, yeah, I would look to some of California's and San Francisco's policies, of course. I mean, in New York City, we're looking to try and do just volume based pricing would make a huge difference. Um, and I'm focused more on the policies that affect the built environment rather than things like EPR in my work. So that, that save us you throw, we have to really think of carefully how to implement in a dense city. Thanks, Claire. And you did mention biomimicry in your talk, um, and that's a really excellent um, field for folks to, to explore in terms of um, models for how to make more circularity happen based on the models of nature. So um, take a look at biomimicry. Uh, we got a lot of questions for Lindsay. We're probably only going to get to one here, but I encourage you to reach out to Lindsay. Lindsay, if you want to put your contact in the chat, before we end here, uh, we have a couple more minutes. So let's see, where will we start? Uh, we'll start with Brenda. Uh, let's see, well, maybe, yeah, Brenda. How does California's solid waste franchise districts impede your collection service? Is that an issue for you? Uh, no, it hasn't been. Um, I think that we, <laughs> the conversations we've had with both recology and waste management uh, are overwhelmingly supportive of getting some, some help and in, in offloading some of the waste that they're collecting. So I will say that our experience has been one of, of complete collaboration um, based on the fact that they're drowning in waste and uh, really need to, to help or basically need the help of new systems. Gotcha. We'll, we'll tackle one more um, in the next two minutes that we have here uh, from Carrie or Carr Wagner for Lindsay. Is there an LCA for reusables versus disposables without the transportation, just dishwashing compared to single use? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, so we haven't done it internally. They're actually pretty expensive to conduct, um, but Upstream has really good resources with all of uh, the um, LCAs that ha have come ki become available. The one that we like the most is kind of a meta-analysis, I think, out of Zero Waste Europe, um, where they look at a lot of studies and so kind of have, uh, I think, put together 13 different studies and really reuse wins. Um, and when we look at where our biggest kind of carbon drivers are, it's, it's not the transportation or the dishwashing, it's actually the manufacturing of the goods. And so we're, we kind of started dispatch with the products that were available on the market. Um, so uh, steel packaging was, was a great option. We're going through a, a full product design right now um, to really uh, decrease the weight and, and look for the lowest footprint materials that still make economic sense um, for um, the containers that dispatch will design, custom design and, and um, you know, kind of offer going forward. Um, but it's something that we constantly look back to. And it was kind of surprising to us that, that the transportation actually is a very small part of this all. Um, and items would be generally transported 
uh, further if they were to be recycled um, than if they were or landfilled than they are where we keep things on a very local infrastructure. So, so the footprint of the transportation is a lot lower with reuse generally and kind of how we think about micro hubs mm, um, than our current recycling kind of infrastructure. Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, that's an excellent segue into our first keynote of the day. So I'm going to thank you all. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Adoma. Thank you, Claire and Lindsay, uh, for getting us started today. And I'm going to pass it back to Ruth, who will introduce our first keynote speaker for today.